So, welcome. I'm Patty Sherwood. I'm the uh, current president of the Jefferson County Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome everyone here. What a great crowd. I know we're in some, for some awesome information here today for us to become a little bit more familiar with where we are in the Eastern Panhandle and the state and where we're going. So, no pressure, but we're expecting good news, okay? Um, before I start, I just want to acknowledge that this gathering today uh, was a joint effort and you know how much we like collaboration. So we're all here today because of a, a coordinated effort between the Jefferson County Chamber of Commerce, the Martinsburg Berkeley County Chamber of Commerce, the Jefferson County Development Authority, and the Berkeley County Development Authority. Uh, we all are working every day to um, promote uh, the Eastern Panhandle and make it a, a, a better and great place to do business as well as live. So I just want to take a minute to recognize some folks uh, from those organizations that are here today. And um, I realized that um, Heather McIntyre did not put her own name on the list, but Heather is the exec of the Jefferson County Chamber of Commerce. We also have Elizabeth Webster, um, the executive director of the Martinsburg Berkeley County Chamber of Commerce, along with um, her staff, Natalie Klein and Annette O'Connor. Also here with us today is Dennis Jarvis and Krista Huffman from the Jefferson County Development Authority and Jennifer Smith from the Berkeley County Development Authority. So thank uh, all of those people for their great service. And I'm going to introduce our speaker, John Deskins. Um, before that, I'll just announce that after John's presentation, um, he's normally uh, ready to and welcomes questions from the audience. And today, he's going to have um, some backup with that. So after John's presentation, we're going to have a little panel here. So if you have questions, uh, you can get those answered. And joining uh, John a little bit later will be Jim Linsenmeyer, who's with the West Virginia De Department of Economic Development, and uh, Jennifer Piercy, who is here from the uh, Senator Shelley Moore Capito's office with us today. So thank you all. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about John. I don't know uh, if everybody loves an economist as much as I do, but um, we're all business people here. You have to know the numbers in order to be able to run a successful business. So this will be great insight for us. Uh, John Deskin serves as Assistant Dean for Outreach and Engagement, Director of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research, and Associate Professor of Economics in the College of Business and Economics at West Virginia University. Um, so I think he's busy. But he leads the Bureau's efforts to serve the state by providing rigorous economic analysis and macroeconomic forecasting to business leaders and policymakers across the state. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Tennessee. Go balls. Um, Deskin's academic research has focused on economic development, small business economics, and government tax and expenditure policy, primarily at the U.S. state level. His work has appeared in outlets such as Contemporary Economic Policy, Public Finance Review, Economic Development Quarterly, Small Business Economics, Public Budgeting and Finance, Regional Studies, Annals of Regional Science, tax notes and state tax notes, as well as in books published by Cambridge University Press and the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Um, Deskins has testified before the United States Senate, the United States House of Representatives, and the West Virginia Legislature. He has delivered more than 300 speeches to business, government, and community groups, and his quotes have appeared in numerous media outlets such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Bloomberg, CNBC, National Public Radio, and PBS. 
He served as principal investigator and co-principal investigator on more than $2 million in funded research. So he comes to us with great credentials. And please help me welcome John Deskin. Thanks a lot. So happy to be over here. I don't make it out to Jefferson County too much, but really happy to be here today. I love coming to this part of our state. Uh, and just a real huge thank you. I mean, it's already been stated, but a real huge thank you to Jim Linsenmeyer with uh, the State uh, Development Office, uh, Jennifer Smith, Elizabeth Webster, and Heather McIntyre. Those are the four folks that came together to put this event together. And I'm so happy to be uh, able to partner with those events, to, to, to partner with those people to host this event. So thanks so much to all four of you. Um, I just will say, you know, we this is this is not level, so this keeps sliding down. Uh, I will say, you know, we produced a full West Virginia Economic Outlook report, uh, which has five chapters and a lot of detail on the state's economy. Uh, to cut back on printing costs and to, and to save trees, I just gave you a copy of chapter two of that full report on your table today, and I gave you a few copies as well of our specific Eastern Panhandle Economic Outlook report. But go to that website, or even better, just Google WVU Bureau of Business and Economic Research, and you can go and find the full economic report. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to touch on today is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more information about our state's economy in that full report, so I hope that my talk is interesting enough that I inspire you to kind of go uh, and check out the full report. So uh, to go a little bit off script here at the very beginning, you know, my point is to come here and talk about uh, the state economy and the Eastern Panhandle economy. Nobody asked me to come and talk about the national economy. Um, but the fact of the matter is right now we face tremendous, tremendous uncertainty nationally with what's happening nationally. Uh, there's a fairly high probability that a recession will happen in 2023 or maybe even right now. Uh, maybe we're already in it, uh, even based on data from the fourth quarter of last year, we'll see. But anyway, uh, there's a pretty good chance that a recession will happen. There's a lot of uncertainty. If that recession does happen nationally, that will definitely impact us in West Virginia as well. We're certainly not isolated from economic events in the rest of the country. So, so it makes sense to start off just for a few minutes by talking about the national economy so we can set the stage for understanding what's happening with our state. Um, of course, no big shocker, this is the issue that I'm concerned about, right? Here's the inflation picture. Um, I hope you all can see that okay in the back of the room. I mean, it'd be better to have maybe a couple. You can see it pretty good? Uh, good. Thank you for that. Um, anyway, there you see the national inflation rate. That's the issue that is giving us so much trouble uh, all across the country. Uh, as you see, inflation has been over 8% uh, you know, for several months over the past year or over the year, last year and a half or, or so. Um, and as you can see in the figure, I mean, you have to go back to the early 1980s to see a rate of inflation that's as high as what we've been seeing here over the last year. I mean, just think about it. You go out and buy a basket of goods and services a year ago, pay $100. Now you buy the exact same thing and it's $108. It's a big deal, it's a big problem. We have had a little bit of improvement in the inflation figure, as you can see on the very right-hand side of the, of the, of the chart there, uh, but we certainly need that to get back down to a smooth, stable, uh, steady 2% rate. Um, the inflation is causing a lot of pain and hardship for people who have limited budgets and who are seeing these price increases. Uh, and even just more broadly than the obvious pain that you can that you can understand intuitively, uh, economic history has shown us very, very, very clearly that we have to get rid of this inflation. We have to have uh, low and steady inflation to encourage investment in the economy. In economic history in this country and in many other countries has shown us that high and volatile inflation like what we've seen uh, cripples investment uh, and, and it really cripples long run economic prosperity uh, and growth. So we have to get rid of this inflation. So that's kind of the economic development priority number one for the nation right now. Uh, it, it makes sense for us to think about what's caused this inflation. And really it's a fact, it, it's kind of this perfect storm 
of four factors that have come together really at the same time to create all this inflationary pressure. Um, oil prices, of course, oil prices have gone down uh, over the past few months, thank goodness. But if you look back over the last year, uh, everybody knows that oil prices were so, so, so high there in, I guess, the now I'm forgetting, but maybe the late winter, spring, early summer of this past year. Uh, high oil prices obviously are directly an important part of what, what the typical household spends money on. Gasoline obviously is important for a typical household. But even aside from that, I mean, high oil prices factor into the cost of everything in the economy because everything has to be transported, right? That lasagna had to be transported from somewhere to here. So higher gas prices increase the price of that lasagna, right? Higher gas prices filter through to higher prices across the board. That's one factor that's creating inflationary pressure in the economy. Second, of course, we know that we've had all these supply chain constraints over the globe ever since COVID hit. For three years now, we've seen specific goods here and there in short supply. You know, at some point, used goods, used cars were up 50% in price. Uh, and of course, that's because new cars were just so, so, so hard to come by. Anyway, if, uh, if we have supply chain constraints because of issues associated with COVID, then if, if a good is, you know, in short supply, economics 101 price is going to go up. That's another source of inflationary pressure. Uh, on top of that, several million people nationally left the labor force over the, over the course of 2021, 2022, 2022, above and beyond what we would normally see. Several million people leaving the labor force. That's left a lot of uh, gaps in terms of workforce. A lot of job openings out there. I'm going to talk about that more later on in the presentation when we get to West Virginia specifically. But these labor force shortages, that, that means that businesses have to pay more to find the workers they need. They pass those higher wages onto the consumer in the form of higher prices. A third source of inflationary pressure. Then, of course, the fourth factor is uh, a demand side factor. The first three are all supply side issues, but the fourth is a demand side factor. Uh, the federal government and the Federal Reserve uh, both took very, very, very aggressive actions during COVID to try to stimulate the economy. We saw tax cuts, we saw major, major, major spending increases coming from the federal government. And at the same time, we saw very aggressive monetary policy coming from the Federal Reserve to lower interest rates, to bring interest rates down to incredibly low levels, all in an effort to stimulate the economy. So you have three factors that are constraining supply in the economy. You have one factor that's really boosting demand, trying to create strong demand in the economy. And the result is, well, 40 year highs in the rate of inflation. That's, that's, what, that's the situation that we found ourselves in. So the, the best way to fix the inflation would of course be to just fix these problems, right? Fix the gas prices issue, fix the supply chain constraints, fix the labor force shortages. Uh, that's what we would like to do, but Clearly, there's no easy, quick, short-term fix to those issues. If there were uh, such a fix, we would have already done it by now. Uh, so what we're left with is kind of a second best option. We're relying on the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates in the economy to push down overall demand. We can't fix the specific problems because they're so uh, complicated. So we're relying on the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates to just push down demand of the economy to reduce demand for everything, and that will bring down that inflationary pressure. So this is a picture that shows you interest rates. The bottom rate, uh, the blue line, is the rate that the Fed targets specifically. Then I've shown you a couple of other interest rate measures that are pretty common benchmarks to also show just how these rates tend to move together. But you can see how aggressively the Fed has raised rates uh, not, not this year now, but ever since the spring of last year, you can see how aggressively the Fed has raised that blue line. We're trying to just raise rates to push down demand for everybody. To, the term economists use is to, is to choke inflation out of the economy. It's a blunt instrument. It's a second best approach, but it's the right thing to do and it has to be done. Uh, I don't know of any economist who disagrees with the notion that we should be doing this, we should be raising rates. But the question now is over 
how aggressively should we be raising rates? Should we raise rates a little bit? Should we raise rates a moderate amount? Should we raise rates very aggressively, right? The question is over how aggressive should the Fed be? So we're hoping that the Fed's able to push down demand of the economy just enough to soften the economy. It may bring down growth, but we're hoping that it pushes down demand just enough that we can we can get by without a recession and get rid of inflation. But how long has it been since the Fed has done this with this level of aggression? The Fed's done this several times over the past few decades, but not to this degree. It's been 40 years since the Fed has acted this aggressively to combat inflation. So we hope the Fed is able to just engineer this just right to walk this tightrope to push down demand, to get rid of inflation, but to still keep us out of a recession. But there's a real good chance, since the Fed hasn't done this in 40 years, since the economy is always changing, we don't necessarily know for sure how the economy is going to react to interest rate increases of this magnitude. There's a real chance the Fed's going to push just a little bit too hard, or maybe even a lot too hard, and put us into a recession. I mean, for interest rates to go up this high, this fast, there's a real chance that it may be too much. There's a real chance that it may put us into recession. That's what we're worried about. And these interest rate impacts, by the way, economists have, have researched this and they, economists have said for decades that for interest rate increases like this, it takes about nine months to see the effect. So we're just now seeing the effect of the first interest rate increases that happened in March of last year. So it's going to be all this year that we're going to be realizing the impact that these interest rate increases have on our economy. And we'll see over the course of this year, has the Fed acted appropriately or has the Fed acted, I mean, it is possible the Fed hasn't acted strongly enough. I doubt that, but that's possible. Or has the Fed acted too aggressively and are we, are we cutting back too strongly? Are we going to wind up into a recession as a result? That's the context that we're in. Okay, Before, now that I'm going to start talking about West Virginia, this is the national context. The most aggressive interest rate increases in 40 years, lots of uncertainty. We know, by the way, the last time the Fed did this, the result was a bad recession. The last time this happened in 82, 83, it was a very severe, very bad recession. So are we going to live that? Or, I mean, are we going to relive that? Or are things going to be different? Lots of uncertainty. If you look at the stock market, of course, you all know the S&P 500 last year lost about 19 or 19.5 percent. This is why, right? We are in a period of tremendous uncertainty with this type of interest rate increases. Stocks don't like uncertainty, so it's no surprise that the market would lose almost 20 percent in the face of this much uncertainty. So when I give you, <laughs> this is kind of my ace in the hole, you might say, when I give you my forecast, if I'm right, then of course that, that's because I'm brilliant. But if I'm not right, it's because of this much un uncertainty, right? So, so no matter what happens, uh, I'm off the hook. <laughs> anyway, so uh, since we're still here in January, since we're at the beginning of the year, I've kind of entitled this presentation, What to Look For in 2023 as we uh, see what's happening nationally, as we see what happens with any momentum that we've built in West Virginia, these are the things that you should look for as we go through this year. Uh, I'll start off by talking about jobs. Here you see a picture that just depicts the total number of jobs in our state, the blue line, and the total number of jobs in the nation, the yellow line, uh, I just put on there for comparison purposes. The figure kind of speaks for itself. You see what a roller coaster we've gone through over the past three years. When COVID hit, the big cliff that we fell off of, uh, when COVID hit, we lost 95,000 jobs in West Virginia. And that 95,000 amounted to 14% of all the jobs in the state. And we've seen 14% we've seen job loss before. We saw it in the early 80s. We saw it in the 1930s during the Great Depression and, other, and some other times as well. So we've seen job loss of this magnitude, but we've never seen anything happen this quickly. We've never seen 14% job loss happen over the course of three months. Right? The Great Depression took over three years for it to fully unfold. But this was 14% job loss in three months. Never have we seen anything like that before. But the growth coming out of the kind of the depth of the COVID recession, I think, has been pretty strong. And just last fall, we returned 
back to where we were in January of 2020. So you can kind of look at the blue line and we've now fully recovered from the COVID recession. Uh, last fall, we added the last of that 95,000 jobs back to uh, West Virginia. So, you know, in some sense, we should be celebrating, right? We should be saying, oh, this is awesome. West Virginia has now recovered all of its jobs that it's lost and we can go forward. But at the same time, for the reasons I just described, it's kind of hard to celebrate this recovery given the amount of uncertainty that we face and given the probability of a new recession. So it's kind of a glass half full, glass half empty view. But at least you can say we have fully recovered from the COVID recession. This is the same data. I don't, I don't know that this figure is all that important really, but, but this is the same data, but I've just reconstructed it to, to take on an indexed approach. So you can see what the percent change was. So the index goes from 100 down to 86. So going to 86, that reflects the 14% job loss I described just a second ago. But the reason I reconstruct this data into an indexed approach is so you can make a clean comparison between the state and the nation. And I like to show this figure because I think it's remarkable actually how similarly we looked in West Virginia compared to the nation. If you look at the start of COVID up through a year and a half in, we were almost identical in West Virginia compared to what we saw in the nation. I don't fully know why that is. I have some suspicions, but I don't fully understand why that is. But I just think it's kind of remarkable to think that we've looked so much like the nation. Uh, we have lagged the nation a little bit over the last year or year and a half, uh, but still altogether pretty similar performance in West Virginia compared to the nation. We are almost exactly, we're, if you look at the data exactly, we're like 100.15% of where we were in January 2020. The nation's a little bit ahead. The nation's more like 101%, but still close enough. This figure, so the yellow bar in the middle, it's labeled 100%. So that means the total number of jobs in West Virginia is 100% of what it was in January 2020, just as I just said. But the point of this figure is to show you how that recovery has varied across the different industrial super sectors. So professional and business services, 104%. It's, it's recovered and added another 4%. Uh, financial activities, maybe because of our friend Mark, maybe you had a good good part of this. Financial activities up to 104% as well. Uh, manufacturing, 101%. Construction, 101%. Down here, you have some sectors like education and health, still 98%. So the, the reason I show this figure is just to make the point that we have fully recovered. We made it through the COVID recession, but the state economy actually does look different in some important ways because even though we have the same number of jobs, we've had some important movement from different sectors. Some sectors that still have a ways to go, some sectors that have uh, continued on even healthy growth past that point of full recovery. So we do look different despite, um, despite that 100% mark. This is our employment forecast for West Virginia. Uh, this is where we are right now. And we do expect continued growth through 2023. It actually doesn't look that impressive with the scale that I have here, but that actually amounts to about 1% growth is what we are forecasting for West Virginia for this year. Um, that's actually uh, definitely on par with what's expected for the nation, subject to a lot of uncertainty, but that's what we expect to happen. We think this is the result basically of the continued momentum that we've seen in West Virginia with several good positive announcements, several positive things that have happened across our state and especially in this part of the state. After that, we actually do forecast a flat period for West Virginia altogether. Um, this forecast, it's not my hunch. It's not my gut. This is not, this is not my idea. Right, this forecast is constructed from an analysis of over 50 variables that characterize the West Virginia economy and the use of econometric methods to understand how those variables interact with each other and how they point to future changes. This is what the data says for West Virginia. This is not my opinion. This is what the data say. In some sense, if we keep doing what we're doing, then we're going to see this flat period later on in the forecast period. Not 2023, but for the next few years, the data indicate that if we keep maintaining the status quo, this is what's gonna happen. That's not to say that if we make changes 
And if we pursue our economic development opportunities more aggressively, if we do more to overcome our economic development challenges, we can make things different and the forecast won't be you know, this, you know, what actually happens won't be equal to this forecast. It's based on past data. But that's what the status quo says. Um, but basically, this flat period that we're calling for really results from uh, the long run impacts of those interest rate increases nationally, but also it's mostly stemming from uh, some long run uh, regional challenges and some long run demographic challenges that we face in our state that I'm going to talk about here in just a few minutes. But at least for this year, about 1% growth, that's a good thing. For this figure, the blue bars show you what has happened to the number of jobs in each industrial super sector over the last decade, and the yellow bars show you what we expect to happen to the number of jobs in each industrial super sector going forward. I'm not gonna go through this figure because it's very busy. Uh, you know, you got 11 different sectors to talk about. Uh, there's a specific forecast there for each of those 11 sectors in our economy. The reason I show you this is just to say that if you go to that full report, you'll find a whole bunch of detail on a sector by sector basis. I'm just kind of putting this up here to give you encouragement to go to the full report to find that level of detail on a sector by sector basis. My eyes are not super good and you look like you're straining as well. Uh, what was that? <laughs> I, I, I'm getting old too. Which, which line are you looking for? Well, if you go to the full report, you'll, uh, you can get it and you won't have to strain, but I feel like I'm doing that same thing all the time in terms of straining. So that was what to watch for in terms of job growth statewide. Now let's switch gears to the Eastern Panhandle specifically, what to watch for here in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, for the report that you have in front of you, I, I'm just defining the Eastern Panhandle as these three counties. I assume that's pretty straightforward. I think occasionally you'll run into people in West Virginia who include like Mineral, Hampshire, Grant, Hardy as part of the Eastern Panhandle, but we don't do that. Uh, the report is just for those three counties. This, this figure here is not that big of a deal. It's just to show you the number of jobs in each county. And you can see how the three counties uh, kind of vary quite a bit in size in terms of jobs. I will say, however, this is misleading for Jefferson County because in Jefferson County, we have about 45% of the people who work in West Virginia commute out of the county for their jobs. So you have, I mean, this just shows the jobs that are in Jefferson County. It doesn't count somebody who lives here, but who commutes over to somewhere in Virginia to work. So if you were to kind of show the size of Jefferson County in terms of the number of people who had jobs, uh, it would be more like up here. But uh, anyway, this is just the number of jobs in the county. So just that's kind of the disclaimer on that figure. But here you see uh, what's happened in the Eastern Panhandle specifically as well over the course of COVID. Now I have the Eastern Panhandle in the blue line and I have West Virginia in the comparison color yellow. We followed a similar trajectory. I mean, the job loss altogether was uh, kind of similar in magnitude, but a sharper recovery, a faster recovery. And now we come in, compare this point to that point, we're coming in at more like 101% of where we were, whereas the state, as I said a second ago, is more like 100%. Uh, so the recovery has been faster and stronger here in the Eastern Panhandle. I don't think that's gonna come as a surprise to any of you. Um, I'm going to talk about variation and growth across regions of our state in just a minute. Um, but just to kind of give you a little preview, th the regions of West Virginia that were doing well before COVID continued to do relatively better during COVID. Like the, the pattern of what parts of our state were strong versus weak, COVID did not change that in any way whatsoever. So Jefferson County was strong before COVID. We made it through COVID even, uh, even better than the state altogether, as you can see by the more rapid recovery and the stronger recovery. Uh, it may not be uh, totally appropriate to compare the Eastern Panhandle to West Virginia, uh, because clearly things are very, very different here compared to Mingo County or McDowell County or something like that. So here's kind of the same data, uh, but, but now instead of offering you West Virginia as the comparison, I'm offering you the Hagerstown MSA as the comparison. Is that good? 
Thank you. Thank you so much. This was, I think this was actually Jim Listen, Listen Meyer's idea. I, I should just lie and take credit for it myself, but I think, I think Jim told me to do this. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but here's a comparison to the Hagerstown MSA, and it's kind of a similar picture. Um, the, I, I mean, I, I, I'm just looking at the picture. I mean, you can look at it just as easily as I can, but uh, here in the Eastern Panhandle, again, the recovery was faster and stronger compared to the recovery in the Hagerstown MSA. Uh, you can see we, come, we, we came to a full recovery sooner, and we have progressed on... Uh, beyond that early 2020 level of employment, even more so compared to Hagerstown. So, so Jefferson County looks good to com compared to West Virginia, but even compared to this region with uh, kind of the inclusion of Maryland and Virginia, we still look good, right? By any of these metrics, Jefferson County still looks good. Now, the next figure is the one that you all are going to really like. Uh, so the blue bars show you what's happened to the number of jobs in each region over the last decade, and the yellow bars show you what we expect to happen to the number of jobs in each region over the coming five years. So for Jefferson County, Jefferson County actually lost jobs over the last decade. If you look, I mean, because this ends in 2021, right? It's a little bit misleading because it ends during that COVID year, but Jefferson County actually lost a few jobs because of the cut point for the data, but we expect very, very strong growth in Jefferson over the next five years. We actually expect Morgan to outperform Jefferson a little bit, uh, but here's Jefferson, here's Berkeley, here's the U.S., Hagerstown, MSA, and West Virginia all together. I mean, we are expecting average annual growth in Jefferson County that's almost double what we expect nationally. We expect Berkeley to do very well too, but not quite as good as Jefferson, but growth that's almost double uh, the national figure is what we're calling for. And again, that's not my hunch. That's not my opinion. That's what the data say based on the really careful analyses that we do. So uh, good news going forward for, um, uh, for Jefferson County. And again, here's Hagerstown and here's Winchester. We actually threw Winchester in this one as well too. Uh, which one do y'all think is more relevant? Hagerstown? Or Winchester. Oh, Winchester is more relevant. Okay, well, Winchester has experienced off the charts growth over the last year, over the last decade, I mean to say, uh, but the growth going forward is expected to be slower in Winchester. Anyway, but regardless of the comparison group, uh, you can see where Jefferson and Berkeley stack up. They look good, uh, whichever comparison you pull out. Moving on, another thing to look for in 2023, labor force growth. Here you see the unemployment rate for the state and for the nation. Right now, we're talking about unemployment that's down here that's around the 4% mark. Uh, for the state and for the nation, we see unemployment that is at basically a historic low. Maybe during World War II, maybe one point in the late 60s, uh, but we are pretty much at historic lows in terms of the unemployment rate. And just look at how rapidly unemployment improved coming out of that COVID recession where we hit a high of 16% uh, when COVID was at its worst. Most of this improvement in the unemployment rate comes from what you would expect. Most of the improvement comes from people who lost jobs and they find new jobs. Okay, so most of this statistic is legit. But you have to remember when you look at this unemployment statistic, you have to remember that you, you have to be actively looking for work to be considered unemployed. So, so this is the trick. If you lose your job, you start looking for work, well, that causes the unemployment rate to rise. But if you quit looking for work and if you decide to retire early, or if you decide to go back to school, or if you decide to be a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, that actually causes the unemployment rate to fall. Labor force attrition often causes the unemployment rate to fall the way it's measured. So most of the improvement is from people finding jobs. Some of the improvement is due to labor force attrition that we've seen in West Virginia and nationally over the course of COVID. So we're at historic lows, but that's a little bit misleading because some of that improvement is from labor force attrition. The market's still good, the market's still strong, but you just have to remember that caveat in mind. So actually, if, if you go back to my previous slide, the thing we're looking for is labor force growth. We actually expect some of those people who left during COVID to come back into the workforce. 
And, we, and this increase in the unemployment rate that's expected for the state and for the nation, that's, that actually is not being driven by a new recession. Even though there's a high probability of a new recession, we're not calling for a recession. These data don't reflect an expected recession. This increase is just simply due to people coming back into the labor force. So that's a really, really important thing that may happen. That's why it's an important thing to look for as we go through the course of 2023 to see if these people do come back into the workforce as expected. If that happens, it's going to help the job opening situation. It's going to help the inflation situation. It's going to help the economy altogether. But that's what we expect. I mean, we expect the unemployment rate to rise, but in a good way because more people start looking for work. But let's see if that actually happens. Moving on, uh, I'll, I'll just say right up front, this issue is not as relevant here in Jefferson County, not by any means. Uh, but this, for the state altogether, is the most important issue that we face in West Virginia. This is the most important single statistic to characterize the West Virginia economy. Now, the previous statistic, the unemployment rate captures among everyone who wants to work, how many people are working versus how many people are looking for work. Okay. But this is your more important, or not, not, not more important necessarily, but it's your more fundamental, more your, your more of your long-term statistic. Because this captures how many people want to work. Never mind whether they are working or looking for work, but how many people want to work in the first place. Nationally, the rate's 62%, and that's actually a lot lower than it was 15 years ago. But whatever, it's 62% nationally. As you see, West Virginia comes in dead last at 55%. I emphasize this very, very, very strongly when I'm speaking in other parts of the state because this is so important. In West Virginia, we will never, ever, ever achieve the prosperity that we hope for unless we can get more of our people in the workforce, unless we can get this blue bar to move to the right. There's no way that we could have a per capita personal income figure that's on par with the national average if we have 7% 7 of our adults sitting on the sidelines compared to the national average. Not 7% in total, just 7% below the national average. No way. So finding ways to get more of their people in the workforce is central. Not, I'll show the statistic for here in just a minute. Uh, it looks a lot better here in Jefferson County, but we have some counties in West Virginia where the labor force participation rate is shocking. It's 30%. In McDowell County, the labor force participation rate is 30%. Three out of 10 adults in McDowell County are either working or looking for work. How can you expect to have any growth with that? Anyway, um, in a similar vein, here's the job openings rate. This is a statistic that I never did show before COVID, but with the labor force attrition, attrition that we've seen, this has actually kind of become an important, interesting statistic. Job openings. Uh, it, it's improved a little bit, but just a few months ago, the job openings rate was as high as 8%. So that means out of every 100 jobs that employers want to have, out of every 100 jobs that employers want to have, eight of those jobs are unfilled. You can see the situation is bad nationally, but it's even worse here in West Virginia. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about. This is one big reason for that inflation. I mean, we're talking about a, almost a doubling of the job openings rate since before COVID. So, uh, so we think more people will come into the labor force. We think the statistic is going to continue to improve, but that's an important thing to watch for as we go through the course of this year. The unemployment rate for the Eastern Panhandle specifically, well, if you think, you ha if you think we have a strong job market in West Virginia, uh, it's even lower here. You know, what can I say? I mean, the unemployment rate is at historic lows nationally and in the state, and it's even lower in the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, labor force participation, it's uh, such a big deal in almost every part of West Virginia. Uh, but here in Berkeley County and Jefferson County, you can see how the labor force participation rate is so, so strong. Um, these two counties have stronger participation rates than Hagerstown or Winchester, stronger participation rate than the nation, and a much, much, much stronger participation rate than the state. So I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what to say. I mean, it's, I, I don't need to belabor my talk here, but I mean, things are just looking really good here in pretty much every way. Uh, that's a really, really, really important indicator of the strength in this part of the state, that labor force participation rate. I'm kind of switching gears, but I actually didn't have a place to put this figure. I wanted to show this to you all, but it didn't flow with my presentation, so I just stuck it here. Um, I'm serious, like I didn't know where to put it, and I'm like, ah, the audience won't care. 
Uh, so I just dropped it in, but here's per capita personal income for each region in, uh, for each county in our region. Um, Jefferson actually, even though things are going really well, Jefferson actually does lag the nation in terms of per capita personal income. Jefferson, I think, is the, it's the second or third highest county in the state in terms of per capita personal income, but we're a little bit low than, um, than the nation, uh, above Winchester, above Hagerstown, and as you see, Berkeley actually comes in a little bit lower, but that's how it stacks up. In either, either one of the counties, of course, uh, are stronger than the state altogether. Another thing to watch for in 2023, output growth. Uh, so far, I've talked about jobs and the labor market, but now take just a minute to talk about GDP. I don't have any GDP specific statistics for the Eastern Panhandle because the statistics are not great for uh, just counties. Um, but here's an important statistic to look at though when you're thinking about the state economy altogether. Uh, so GDP captures the total market value of all the stuff that we produce in our economy. The, the yellow bars show you growth in GDP for the nation. The blue bars show you growth in GDP for the state for every year going back however many years. I have forecast 2023 based on three quarters of data. So 20, not 23, 2022. This is based on three quarters of data. Uh, there's still one quarter of data left before that's really finalized. But, but if, if the pattern uh, continues, after, four quarter, after fourth quarter 2022 comes out, that will mean that West Virginia has actually lagged the nation in terms of output growth for 11 years in a row. You can count back one years, two years, three years, four years, five years. It goes back 11 years that the state has underperformed the nation in terms of output growth. So um, that's not good. That's a real strong example of uh, how our state's uh, not achieving its full potential in many ways. Hopefully 2023 brings something different because I would hate to continue on to 12 years consecutive that we have lagged the nation. Another really important thing to understand about West Virginia, and this, I'm not going to get into this full discussion. There's a real big can of worms here that you could get into. Uh, I think we were actually talking about this just a minute ago when we were talking about where to invest economic development resources. But if you want to understand West Virginia, it's really important to understand how diverse our state is from region to region. Just, just This is a pretty shocking statistic. Uh, this figure is pre-COVID. I, I wanted to cut this off at the end of 2019 so it wouldn't be distorted by COVID-related factors because uh, I just want to make a point here. But for this chunk of years leading up to COVID, uh, going through the end of 2019, I've highlighted the top 10 growth counties in blue and then the other 45 counties. Over this period, if you can see the, I mean, here all the information is contained in the note, uh, but over this period, the top 10 growth counties added 16,000 jobs, whereas the other 45 counties collectively lost 44,000 jobs. So vast, vast differences between the parts of West Virginia that are doing well versus the other parts of West Virginia. And, and sometimes there's this dichotomy. If you look at the good news that's been coming out over the last year or so, you know, this new plant opening up in this county, this new plant opening up in that county, here, here, here. The fact of the matter is there's this kind of a dichotomy between these pieces of good news, on the one hand that you hear that are anecdotal accounts, versus the statewide statistics that I show that represent the whole state. Like how can these good, good things be happening Whereas this guy from the VU is coming in talking about how we're flat. And the fact of the matter is, we do have good things happening, but those good things are so, so, so concentrated in just a few counties. And the fact is, we have about 45 counties that are just moving sideways at best. Some counties with good things happening, so many counties that are just moving sideways. I want to keep the good things happening. I, I, absolutely, I celebrate when we hear of a new metals processing plant opening up in Berkeley County or a new thing opening up in this other county. I always celebrate and love those bits of good news. But the fact of the matter is that's very concentrated. So many counties are just moving sideways. And that's really important in terms of understanding West Virginia. This is important in so many different ways. I mean, and if you think about how to allocate economic development resources, you have to remember, <coughs> like so many people in Charleston think of just 
kind of a one-size-fits-all development strategy. But that makes no sense, right? I mean, our state is so, so, so different. Right? What we need to do to promote economic development here in Jefferson County is completely different than what we need to do in Logan County, for example. Uh, so we should never, ever kind of fall into this one-size-fits-all development trap. We, we have to tailor economic development strategies to each region's specific strengths and weaknesses and challenges and opportunities. That's an important statistic. Uh, this is our growth forecast going forward on a county-by-county -county basis. Uh, I will say our forecast actually calls for some improvement. The forecast calls for uh, a broadening of the good things. We have more counties that are kind of in the more favorable colors, uh, but even the growth forecast going forward still, uh, still shows a state that's very different from region to region. So I guess my, my point here is what to watch for is, you know, we think the good news will continue to happen in these specific areas, but will that good news start to broaden out to other parts of West Virginia? Another thing to watch for in 2023 in migration. So before I talk about in migration specifically though, I want to show you a figure that depicts the age of West Virginians, or specifically what this figure shows actually is, it shows the change in the number of people in each age group. The blue bars are going backwards, the yellow bars are our forecast going forward. So what it shows is We've seen a decline in the number of people who are 0 to 17, and we expect to see further declines in the number of people 0 to 17. Declines in the 18 to 44 group, declines in the 45 to 64 group, big increases in the 65 and older group. These trends have been happening already, and they're expected to continue to happen. Uh, this is a real problem. And this is one of the factors that really weighs on our economic uh, growth forecast going forward, the aging of our population in West Virginia. So the result of this kind of what you might call negative age distribution is, is for almost a decade now, West Virginia has seen what we call natural population decline. So that means the number of deaths exceeds the number of births. And if you look at the last reading, which uh, was the middle of the previous year through July 2022, if you look at the previous reading, data just came out last month, West Virginia lost 12,000 people to natural population decline. We had 12,000 more deaths than we had births. So that's really kind of an anchor weighing down our economy. And the bad news is there's not really anything you can do about it in the short term. You know, death rates, birth rates are pretty stable statistics for large populations. So there's not a whole lot we can do. We think this natural population decline is going to continue for some time. So what you have to look to is the other part of population growth, which is migration. And that's why I have in migration is the thing to look for in this year. If you look at the last reading, West Virginia actually gained... 2,000 people to end migration. For the last year, we had 2,000 more people move into the state compared to what we saw move out. So that was a good thing. 2,000 is just a drop in the bucket, right? I mean, we saw 12,000 lost to death. We only offset 2,000 of that. So we still lost 10,000 people in the last reading, but at least in migration was positive. So uh, I'm hoping that some of these economic development efforts that we've seen announced in recent months or recent years, I'm hoping that those uh, provide jobs for kind of what, what you might call native West Virginians, but I'm hoping those also encourage more people to move into West Virginia. I also hope we see more people who move here to work remotely to enjoy the scenery and the cost of living and the good things that we have in West Virginia. But if we can have you know, growth and continuance of this trend of positive in-migration, That'll be very, very, very important in kind of offsetting the challenges that we face in West Virginia. Uh, to that point, uh, the yellow line shows the population for our state. You can see since 2013, you can see what's happened to the population figure. We expect it to continue to fall. But in contrast, the Eastern Panhandle, oh boy, um, what a change over here in terms of uh, the population numbers. You all are... Uh, major, major force for 
uh, boosting population in West Virginia. I mean, I mean, just as you can see, it's self-explanatory. The blue bars show the eastern panhandle population specifically. You can see how much it's grown, and we expect that growth to continue. We don't expect any change in that picture going forward in terms of the positive momentum. This is not as important for uh, over here. You know, you don't have any coal mines over here. You don't have any gas. state altogether and it's so important to tax revenue that we do have repercussions from energy markets even here even though we don't see any coal miners walking around here in Jefferson County so growth and energy output uh, although I won't talk about it nearly as in, as in detail here as I do when I'm in Beckley say or Charleston or wherever but this figures uh, you know shows such a contrast um, you have the coal production in West Virginia on the one hand uh, compared with natural gas production in West Virginia. On the other hand, you see what's happened to coal. Coal was 158 million tons over here. Coal was about 95 million tons here just before COVID. COVID was very hard on coal production. If you, if you look at the worst quarter here, and if you annualize that, you'd have to go back to 1918 to see a year in West Virginia with that little coal production. If, if, you, if you ignore a couple of years that were affected by strikes, but that's a different issue. You have to go back 100 years to see a year with that little coal production. The coal production has improved back. So we were 95 million tons here. We fell down now, we're about 85 million tons. We don't know exactly how long coal is gonna stay where it is, uh, but we do expect a return to that long run gradual erosion that we saw before. On the flip side, on the natural gas side, you, you have a little bit of bounces you know, a little bit of bounciness here, a little bit of rockiness here. But for the most part, COVID didn't really affect gas production. Gas production now, if you look on this axis, gas production now is uh, eight or nine times what it was when this gas boom started. And we expect the gas uh, boom to continue. Coal exports from West Virginia. Uh, the war in Ukraine has been horrible. Uh-oh. I could wing it if, if it, I could wing it without the visuals. I could just uh, describe the pictures to you from, and I only have a few more slides left anyway, but uh, it came back, thank goodness. Uh, anyway, the war in Ukraine has been terrible in so many ways. Obviously, a lot of lives lost, and you, know, you see all that on the news, but weirdly enough, the war in Ukraine has actually been really good for uh, West Virginia coal exports. Um, one reason I show you this figure is to say, um, the growth in coal that we have seen over the last couple years has been due to metallurgical coal that's used in steel production and it's been due to coal exports right uh, european countries are trying to get away from that russian uh coal and that russian gas especially so that's helped you know i mean they've come to west virginia right west virginia is taking up some of that gap that's being left in coal and gas from trying to get away from dependence on russia so we've seen really strong growth in coal exports. Um, this is great, right? This has helped bring money into West Virginia. This has helped boost our economy in so many ways, but it's so uncertain. We don't know how long this is going to continue. Just if you look back over the course of the last century, coal exports are up, down, up, down, up, down. Very volatile because there's so many different things that can affect demand for coal globally. Like literally, a flood in Australia can boost West Virginia coal exports. A tsunami in Japan can boost West Virginia coal exports. There's a million factors that can cause that to go up or down. It's been very strong over the last year, but we don't know how long it's going to continue because of so much going on there. Um, also, on the gas side, just, just to make one point about gas before I go on, I already showed you that gas is still continuing to increase in terms of production very rapidly, but the blue line shows you the number of wells that we drill. Number of wells that we drill is is down quite a bit compared to what we've gotten used to over the past decade or over the past 20 years. But the yellow line shows you how much production we get from each new well. And as you can see, it's to the roof, right? Those new wells are so, 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 so much more productive. So even though we have fewer wells being drilled, production's still increasing healthily because of that productivity measure. 
Why do I show this? Does anybody have any guess as to why I'm showing this figure? Well, I, I could talk for a whole hour on that. Uh, so gas prices right now are double what they were when uh, the revenue numbers were put together. And uh, we did some math a couple months ago, and about 20% of the surplus that we see right now is due to those very, very high gas prices. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to gas prices in the future, but the uh, national forecasters expect prices to fall which will reduce some of that surplus uh, as the gas prices move. But there's one other reason why I show this figure. The reason I show it is the productivity numbers are great, right? We want businesses to be productive. But this does have other implications for West Virginia. In particular, this doesn't create that many jobs, right? Once a well has been drilled, there's not very many jobs. What, you know, even if it's producing vast amounts, there's not that many jobs associated with maintaining a well. The jobs that come from gas come from this side, come from drilling wells. So the reason I show this is to say that we're just not getting as much bang for a buck in terms of employment benefits from gas. Even before this dynamic happened, gas was very, very, very capital intensive, meaning that it didn't have very many workers compared to its output. Very, very, very capital intensive sector. But, but now it's even more so. Now we're getting even fewer jobs from gas because of this dynamic. I could go on about that. All this stuff I could go on forever, but I'm uh, worried that I'm running out of time here. I don't want to keep you all too late. One more thing to look for, improvement in human capital outcomes. Um, so I talked before about labor force participation. We have a few big reasons why West Virginia is dead last among the states in terms of labor force participation. Okay, uh, And those big reasons relate to human capital. One reason is we have people, I believe, who would like to work, who want to be in the economy, who want to be contributing, who want to be making money, but they just don't have the education or the training or the workforce preparedness. People who'd like to work, but they know they're not going to get hired because they're just, their job skills, their training, their education is not up to par. So they're not even looking for work in the first place because of that education deficit. I think poor education outcomes is one reason why West Virginia has this low rate of labor force participation. This is one measure of education outcomes, and West Virginia ranks very poorly by this measure. I'm not saying that everybody needs to have a bachelor's degree. There's a lot of jobs that you can go for uh, that pay good, that are great jobs that require two-year or technical training or things like a welding certification or a brick lane certification or whatever. I'm just showing this for illustrative purposes just to make the point that poor education outcomes are keeping people out of the workforce and that's one reason why we have this deficit in labor force participation. Here's the drug overdose death rate picture. This picture is insane. Absolutely, uh, we've gone off the rails in the last year by this metric. Kind of the same story. You have people who would like to be in the workforce, who would like to be contributing, like to be making money, but they've gotten addicted. I mean, addiction is very complicated. I don't understand, I don't even begin to understand all the factors that are associated with addiction or lead to addiction. Um, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here, but the point is we have people who would like to be working, but they're addicted. They know, they're not, they, know they can't pass a drug test. They know that addiction is keeping them down. It's keeping people out of the workforce. There's the drug, overdo of drug overdose death rate. It's, it's not hard at all to argue that this is a big problem in our state. Uh, and the third issue is with health. I don't have a figure here for health just to kind of keep the, the slides simple, uh, but you can look at any health outcome measure. You can look at diabetes, obesity, cancer, smoking, lack of exercise. And you can see, I mean, just walk through this casino if you want to, uh, you know, <laughs> think about the smoking rate. I mean, I, as soon as I walked in the door, I'm like, yeah, high smoking rate going on in, in here. Um, uh, any, not to get sidetracked on that, but any of those health outcome measures, West Virginia is somewhere between 45th and 50th. And same story, you have people who would like to be in the workforce, but some health problems keeping them out. Uh, you have other factors too, like lack of childcare, uh, especially in many of the rural parts of West Virginia, maybe not here so much in Jefferson County, but in, in rural parts of West Virginia, uh, it's hard to find somewhere uh, to take your kid for a daycare. 
that's another factor as well. But we have these big fundamental problems, poor education outcomes, poor health outcomes, poor drug abuse outcomes that are keeping people out of our workforce. I've said many times before, I wish that our big problem in West Virginia was horrible tax policy. Wouldn't it be awesome if that was our problem? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be awesome if we had the most upside down tax system in the world and that was keeping people away? Because we could fix that overnight. Like we could literally fix that by Friday of next week. But our real problems are things like poor education outcomes, poor health outcomes, poor drug abuse outcomes. And those problems are not easy to fix. They take a long time. Even if we do all the, thi even if we do all the things that we should do, it still takes years to really see significant improvements in these measures because of the nature of these problems. So um, I, I don't have specific uh, corresponding measures for you for the Eastern Panhandle. I know the numbers look better over here, of course. Um, but, but I think even here, more can be done, uh, especially to fight the drug abuse problem, uh, to try to get more of our people, I mean, to help improve lives, obviously, but also to help get people, uh, more people in the workforce to boost the overall economy. Another thing to look for in 2023, more of these good announcements. Uh, here's just a few examples of good announcements. I didn't include the most recent Berkeley County announcement on there because I made this slide back in October uh, for my big Charleston presentation before the Berkeley County announcement. I forgot to add it on. Uh, but we've seen all these good announcements. We have positive momentum. And positive momentum, it builds on itself in many parts of West Virginia. So, uh, so to look for more of those good news to encourage uh, you know, more growth and, and also, as I said before, more in migration. My last point to make, the last thing to watch for in 2023, outdoor recreation, tourism, and remote workers. I mean, we have made progress in terms of bringing more tourists to West Virginia. Uh, we've made some progress in terms of developing our outdoor recreation opportunities in West Virginia, uh, and we've made some good progress in terms of bringing remote workers to West Virginia, people who have jobs in Texas or California or New York or wherever, keep their jobs, keep making their money from somewhere in New York, but come to West Virginia, enjoy lower cost of living, enjoy the outdoor amenities that we have here, enjoy all the good things about West Virginia, keep your job spend your money here in our state. Uh, we've seen some great programs that have been developed over the last two years to encourage remote workers. I've met some of these remote workers myself. Some good things are happening. I'm looking for uh, more of those good things to happen in our state. Ultimately, I think that if we do more to develop tourism in our state, if we do more to market tourism to people who live in the Northeast or Washington or the Great Lakes areas or wherever, uh, if we can get these people to come here, if we can get people to see the good things about West Virginia, I think that we might ultimately get, be able to get to a situation where people, when, when you go to somebody outside of the state, and if you say West Virginia, m maybe they'll imagine this, as opposed to imagining, you know, some negative stereotype, fill in the blank, you know, just go white or whatever. Uh, and, and this could have so many benefits in so many different ways, even outside of the tourism economy or the uh, outdoor recreation economy. So uh, that's my take on what to watch for this year. Uh, sorry that I'm giving you a presentation that's clouded with so much uncertainty right from the get-go, but um, that's the situation that we're in. Hopefully we can meet. I mean, I think we're planning on meeting uh, alternating. Next year will be in Berkeley County, so hopefully we can meet in the fall or either next winter in uh, Berkeley County and hopefully I can give you some updates on what actually happened and how many of these metrics moved in the right direction. So we're happy to take questions. Where are my t other two panelists? Or did they, they didn't bail on me, did they? Okay, they just... <laughs> we're headed towards the exit. <laughs> <laughs> You're bailing on me now. Uh, anyway, I don't think we need any more introductions. I think we've already, we're already good to go. All right, so questions for... I don't know what that is. I don't, I don't know what this is, but if I, if I crash the whole system, then it's my fault. So who's got a question for any of the three of us? And again, I'm Jim Lundsenmeyer with the State Economic Development Office. And I'm Jennifer Piercy with Senator Cabot's office. Is there anyone here from the press? 
And all my comments you can attribute to Dennis Jarvis. <laughs> I, I just have one question for you all. Um, how many folks are work in Berkeley County? And how many folks work in Jefferson County? I assume that's so we've got a great turnout from both counties proportionately. And again, I want to thank uh, all of the organizers from the two chambers. Uh, thank you very much. And, and we look forward to uh, having this in Berkeley County next year and uh, the following year in Jefferson County. But thank you very much. You talked about the um, expecting people to come back into the workforce because I think everybody here is looking for employees. So when we see those low unemployment numbers, but people can't find people to hire, what's gonna happen or, or what will change that people will be coming back in? Do you have any thoughts on that? We think it's just simply the, the, the wearing off of the shock that happened during COVID that caused all these people to leave the workforce. Um, and the projection that I have is for the nation and for the state. It's not specific, it's just, it's just nationally we expect kind of continuation of a return to normal. Because uh, COVID was a real big shock to the system, obviously, uh, causing millions of people to leave above and beyond what would normally you know, be observed in a given year. Um, so I, I don't have anything specific to say what's going to drive that. The expectation is just more of a continuance to uh, normalization. We'll see if it happens or not. That's why I'm saying this is something we should watch for, because we don't know. Uh, it's uncertain, but, but we think it's going to happen, and it will certainly have a lot of good e economic implications to get that job openings right down and to help boost uh, overall productivity. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah, just to put a, a local spin on that, I realize that uh, most employers are, are begging for employees, but here are some of the good outcomes that we have observed recently in the Eastern Panhandle. Number one, people are making more money. Number two, we are attracting more people into the state and into the panhandle. And the other thing we're seeing is people are being upskilled in their current jobs. So there's not only a, a growth in personal income of the folks that currently already work here, but we're also seeing upskills uh, per position. I'm gonna piggyback off that as well. Um, you talked about specifically two populations, and that's the people who retired early and then uh, people who don't have childcare. Are you seeing anything being done in those two fields to actually bring people back? No. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think anybody's doing anything specifically with the retiring population, no, but the reason I hesitated was with, was with childcare, because a lot of people have across West Virginia, a lot of people have come to recognize this problem in our rural areas, and I've heard a lot of talk, but I personally have not seen any advances. But I, I don't want to throw anybody into the bus because there may very well be advances that I'm not aware of, but I've seen a lot of people recognize the issue at least, which is obviously step one in terms of fixing the issue, but I personally am not aware of good things that have happened to actually increase access to child care, but th there may be. It's, I don't specialize in that. It's not like I'm a specialist in child care by any means. My kids are old enough now that they don't need child care anyway. Um, but, but there may be, I just, I, I just may be unaware. Uh, in the, either this past legislative session, last calendar year or the year before, there was some uh, legislation uh, to help address the child care uh, issues as far as capacity. And there, ha there is now some incentives uh, for child care facilities. And we've also seen in the Potomac Highlands and in the Eastern Panhandle, some employers um, take the bull by the horns. For instance, at Pilgrim's Pride and Hardy County and Moorfield, they are actually subsidizing a local daycare center. So we're seeing some business models like that. To, to the private sector uh, is getting innovative and taking ownership of that, of that problem. And you know, um, we've had Jennifer Piercy here in the Eastern Panhandle uh, the last several days uh, visiting not only uh, Berkeley County facilities, Clorox, uh, Procter & Gamble, but also here in Jefferson County uh, with Dow and Rockwell 
And uh, Jennifer, I'll let you uh, share with these folks some of the issues that uh, you've heard relative to uh, employment, child care, et cetera. Yeah, so child care has been a big issue, and it's a statewide issue. Um, from, from the conversations that we've had, it now brings awareness because I think what you have is you have some people who opt not to go back into the workforce because somebody's got to be home with those kids until they get to a certain age. Then you also have issues with it can be cost prohibitive. Um, is it, I think people take a look at, is it actually worth it to put your child in daycare and work? Hopefully with the conversation being put out there like it is now, because it has literally come up in every county, in every city, um, every meeting I've ever been in. I think that there are gonna have to be steps taken and there's no quick fix for it. I think it's gonna depend on where you live, the access to it. Um, it's also gonna depend on the employer. Like Jim said, I know of other private entities around the state who are also taking the bull by the horn. Whether that be subsidizing a local child care center, some people are even um, looking at offering on-site child care, particularly because there are rules and regulations that dictate child care and what they can and cannot provide. I think we had another question at the same table. Huh? Thank you, John. Um, I know it's a complicated issue, but I'd love to hear everybody's opinion. Migration this needs to be on the mic. Oh, it doesn't do. Oh, that's yours. Yes. 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 With regards to I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry. We crashed the mic system, and he and I were talking about this mic situation, and I got distracted. I missed your question. That's okay. It turns out that this is his mic for the camera. He's from the news, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You break it, you pay for it. <laughs> but I asked him if he was from the news, and I don't. He's with social connection. Okay, and it's, that's not like a clear yes or no whether that's news or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually working for the Berkeley County Development Authority, and uh, they're um, taking video. Okay. Published later. So we can edit them. Anyway, so yeah. this is his mic. So everything that we just said, he missed it. So <laughs> I'll start over. I, I'm I'm so sorry about that. It's it's all good. Um, so a complicated issue, but I'd love to hear all three of your opinions on this. Um, the in-migration discussion and screaming from the mountaintops, all the positive things we have going on and the quality of life in West Virginia makes sense to me. And the remote work, I think, allows more money to flow in and keep those high paying jobs and work here. I'm curious your opinion on whether it would aid in migration while balancing the concern of um, our balance sheet and the income from a state level, the governor's tax plan to want to reduce the personal income tax? That, that's a really complicated question and economists have researched that to such an extent to see if lower taxes really do make a big impact on in migration figures. Um, my take from the literature is, um, if it would have a an effect, it would be a small effect. And especially if we were to reduce the rate from say 6% to 5% or 4%, uh, any effect would probably be pretty small. Um, because the, the literature doesn't show that taxes create massive effects. They create some effects, but they're usually smaller and taxes are usually shown to be kind of less important than other things in the economy, like the quality of uh, housing options or the quality of public education or the quality of recreational activities. Um, so a lower tax rate would probably have some effect. I guess my question would be what would that effect be compared to the effect of if we took surplus money and instead invested in education or outdoor amenities or infrastructure or other things that would also be attractive to potential migrants? What would be the relative effect of those possibilities? I, I don't know. Um, but I don't think it would be a clear, uh, you lower taxes and there's going to be a wave of in-migration. Thank you. I serve at the will and the pleasure of the governor. <laughs> <laughs> but to your point about outdoor recreation, that is possibly a bigger impact of having great outdoor recreation like we have here in the Eastern Panhandle as far as attracting a skilled and educated young workforce. 
I'm going to try to be as generic as possible when answering this. <laughs> I think within migration, it's just like everything else, there are going to be some factors that are more attractive to some people than others. Some people here might not care about, coming in might not care about outdoor recreation. They might care about lower property taxes. Some people will care about the school system. It's going to depend on if they have kids. I think from an overall game plan, anything that you can do that will attract people into the state, whether it be lower taxes, improving education, roads, infrastructure, anything like that, I don't think that you should ever put all of your eggs in one basket, and eggs are really expensive right now, by the way. <laughs> um, I think that you should try to offer a whole range of enticements to folks to, to come in, and I think that that's what we're getting towards now, is we're trying to, to develop sort of a a la carte menu of different things you can choose from on why you should choose to be in West Virginia and stay here. Okay. Sir. Oh, you, I think you mentioned that it's a statewide problem for child care. Uh, if that's the case, is it, should it be the county's responsibility to try to subsidize child care facilities or should that be something handled by the state? Well, <clears throat> I think that with child care, um, you know, child care for the most part is privately run. They are also um, dictated to and, got, and guided by DHHR, with, which is a state agency. So from an overall perspective of maybe change and different policy decisions that could make an impact, that's going to have to come from the state level. I don't think that from a local perspective that your counties really have that authority to do that right now, but I think by working with state officials and working towards making them more aware that um, there could be some decisions made that would help with that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Are you referencing uh, retail? Retail, big box, restaurants, anything like that for Jefferson County? Uh, I do not know. I, we focus on industrial development. Um, and that doesn't mean heavy industry, OK? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, maybe are there some commercial realtors here in the audience that might be able to generically address that without um, revealing any confidentiality? But I, if someone asked me that question earlier today. Typically, um, a business will come here, an industry member will come here, then you get employees, then retail follows that. So that's it, that's typically how that that rolls. I'm just wishing that Morgantown would get a TGI Fridays, because that used to be my favorite like casual chain and we don't have a TGI Friday so I wish we'd get one but no we don't have that level of forecasting in their report at all in terms of specific uh, businesses like that but I, mean, I would just say that I think the economic data is pretty clear that as momentum continues to build you get more and more and more options um, I, I think that's pretty s certain uh, in terms of looking at economic momentum that we've seen in other areas but unfortunately we don't have anything specific on uh, oh, this many more people will bring a uh, TGI Fridays. There's a gentleman in the way back that has a question. In, in the window, yes. Uh, so, so back to the question about uh, child care, and you started to talk about workforce participation, but regardless of the subsidy, where are the people that would provide that service? Where are they here in the state that you could also find the right funding for it? Or is this just, just not enough? Yeah, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, um, that's the reason why so many of our counties are just moving sideways is because they're sparsely populated, they don't have momentum, and it's hard to build momentum because of 
that reason and because of several other reasons uh, that kind of plague our uh, smaller counties that are dwindling in population. Um, and I, I have no idea where the people are. We, we think labor force entry will occur, um, but that in and of itself is not a certainty, and it's certainly not certain in uh, some of our small rural counties that have seen declines. Um, I mean, in the, in the counties where we have in migration, where, in the counties where we have positive momentum, it's probably easier to accept the idea that people will move in and uh, entrepreneurship will pop up to bring about um, childcare. But, you know, maybe it just won't happen for some of our small rural counties that are at a disadvantage. Uh, I personally am hoping to, to move away from 10 counties on the list of counties where good things are happening to 25 counties, but you know, probably not realistic thing that's gonna happen for all 55 counties given the rural uh, sparse population that we have in some of those areas. But you know, I don't have a, 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 like a magic wand answer to, to, to say that the, the people will come uh, to make that a, a real option in every single rural, rural area. Uh huh, right here. Well, I, I can just say, I'll pass this off because Senator Capito's focused on broadband. You probably want that question. I'll just say that, I mean, it, it, broadband isn't a factor. I mean, it's a deal breaker, right? If there's no broadband, then there's nothing. There's no development beyond that. Um, it, 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 it's a deal breaker up front before you even get into the numerous other things that affect economic development. I will say that when, uh, are, are you familiar with the Ascend West Virginia program, one of the programs that tries to bring remote workers into West Virginia? Well, for the Ascend West Virginia program, they went through a lot of metrics on which towns in West Virginia should be uh, part of Ascend. And the very first metric they used was broadband. And everywhere in the state that didn't have good broadband uh, reliability was off the table immediately before any further analysis even happened. Uh, so it could not possibly be more of an important issue for our rural areas. So, Senator, uh, you know. So, um, Senator Capito has been almost hyper-focused on broadband for a while now. If you go to her website, um, there's something called Capito Connect where we started doing this, I think about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, where we asked folks to share their story. Where do you live? What's the issue? So what we've been doing is we take those stories and we're able to share those in those areas, whether it be with the county commission or the mayor, or it could be the actual service provider in that area. Um, and I'm gonna let Jim speak to this, but from a state level, uh, the state broadband office, they have also offered a series of grants um, and there's a lot of different projects um, across the state right now that are trying to build broadband and bring connectivity to folks. One thing that our staff has worked very hard on is when we find out someone doesn't have access, we try to find out why. Sometimes it's an easy fix, but um, I'm sure as most of you know, we are West Virginia. And in some places, it is very, very hard to get access. And so that's something that we're working toward. And I do think that we've made a lot of positive progress over the past couple of years where more and more people are getting hooked in because with the number of people who are working from home, the Ascend program, and just bringing in economic development period, it's a major, major issue. And like John said, it's, it's a deal breaker. We want to be respectful of everyone's time, and, and Heather, if you will, raise your hand with a fist it, uh, when we're about to close. Not a finger, <laughs> but a fist, okay? You can finish up. No, I, I really don't know that much about broadband, but I know that uh, after the conclusion of the formal program, we will stick around to uh, answer any questions or take any comments uh, that you may have. Jim, Jennifer, John, you can take all of that information and break it down for us so that we kind of have an idea about what's going on. And I'm pretty sure we all will hold you to that positive um, uh, 
program or expectation. So very exciting. Please let us give a round of applause to John and Jennifer and Jim. And our host chamber. Okay. So Again, thank you to the Jefferson County Chamber of Commerce, the Berkeley County Chamber of Commerce, Jefferson County Development Authority, Berkeley County Development Authority. We are all in this together. Um, so many thanks to you folks who are here. Um, I've met an electrician. Uh, there's a lot of bankers in the room, a lot of people in real estate that are committed to growing our community as well as our state. So so um, at some point, we may have enough population to get that TGI Fridays. But in the meantime, the, the more that we can do to support our um, West Virginia businesses, the better. So thank you all for coming out. I want to thank Hollywood Casino and Charlestown Races for hosting us today. And um, these folks will stick around. So have a conversation. And thank you for coming out.